All right, everyone back from coffee. Be assured only one session to go, then you are free to uh, enjoy your time in New York City. Um, I hope you had a nice day. My name is Hermann Lotzekamp. I'm an agricultural economist at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. I'm co-leading the global economics team in, in AgMAP, and I'm also a member of the executive committee. And so my duty is now to chair this, uh, this interesting session on synergizing adaptation and mitigation along the food value chain, um, which is obviously important. I don't need to tell you, but uh, it's not either or, right? It's not either adaptation nor mitigation, but especially in agriculture and food, the combined effects, the combined actions on adaptation and mitigation are, are crucial in my view. And um, we have five excellent uh, contributors here to this session. We'll have two talks, one by uh, Veronica Dörr and one by Bruno Basso. And after that, we have a, a panel here with uh, Apur Burchaki, with Mariana Rufino and Francesco Tubiello. Um, I'll introduce the people um, uh, separately. So um, I hope uh, Veronica, we never met. I hope you are there online. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Let me say a few words of introduction and then the floor is all yours. So uh, Veronica leads the climate change program at the Australian Center for International Agricultural Research. She brokers and funds research and development partnerships between Australians and agriculture and livelihood professionals in countries across the Indo-Pacific seeking to benefit smaller scale producers in developing countries. She has specialized in integrating social and biophysical sciences, social change, practice and system science, applying them to a range of sustainability challenges. Welcome, Veronica. Um, you have roughly 15 minutes for your presentation. Um, so the floor is all yours, please. Thank you so much. And then to the organizers, let me just say that it says I cannot share my screen while you are sharing your screen. <laughs> so we'll get there. Um, but I'm really pleased to be joining you guys from a, a pre-dawn Australia and really sorry I can't be there in person. Um, but uh, but I hope I'm, I'm hope I'm going to give you a bit of a, a stimulating presentation, something to think about a little bit differently um, for your last session of the day. And, and I'll start by saying, um, I'm sure what you're kind of expecting um, out of this session and what, what certainly the panelists will emphasize and, and that you may have been talking about, you know, quite a bit during the day, um, is, is the idea of, of co-benefits along agricultural value chains. Um, so what I've got here is a, a fairly standard, very simplified infographic about an agricultural value chain. And, and just to emphasize that often when we're talking about mitigation and adaptation co-benefits, we're talking about actions um, that might take place at, at, at any point along this value chain. Often we've emphasized the production, the on-farm side, quite a lot. Um, but, but actually, there's a, a range of, of mitigation challenges and adaptation challenges and, and, and opportunities at all stages. Um, so, you know, you could be talking about actions like shortening supply chains um, in the kind of distribution part of the value chain. So, you know, doing that um, should lead to, to lower transport emissions, um, but it can also uh, be an adaptation benefit because there's less disruption to sort of sh shorter supply chains from disaster events. But as you heard in the introduction, I'm a, I'm a research funder, I'm a research manager, and part of what that means is that I spend a lot of my day um, trying to support um, researchers to understand uh, how, their, how their research can have greater impact. And so I wanted to use that background today to talk to you about as long as I can shift my slides, there we go, um, about actually integrating adaptation and mitigation along the research value chain. And we often don't think about research having a value chain, but it absolutely does. And it's it's it can be characterized in a very similar way to agriculture value chains. So when you think about it, the producing of the research, the actual research process itself is very much like what happens on farm. It's the production stage. Um, there are inputs to that research, same as there are for farming. So various data, equipment, everything like that, that we need to use. Um, we don't end at the research. There really is a processing stage 
approach where we, we contextualize it in things like papers and reports and databases that make it accessible. There's even distribution by sharing those things on, on platforms, publishing the papers. Um, and, and even though we don't think about it a lot, the, the sort of retail or, or marketing side of research, we're realizing is increasingly important. How we engage, how the language that we use, the images that we use, how we broker the relationship between research and decision makers. And then, of course, the decision makers themselves are the consumers of research. At least we hope they are um, the policy makers, the land managers that we're trying to reach with the research that we do. So what I wanted to do today is paint you a little bit of a picture of how this research value chain um, it looks quite different from for mitigation versus adaptation to present the real challenge that we have in terms of, of synergizing these things, particularly at the end point where it matters for decision makers to make a real difference on the ground. So I'll do this through a few examples along the value chain. And the first one, which is most familiar to most of us, is, is just to focus on the, on the research itself. So on the mitigation side, this research is, is as you well know, uh, often very quantitative. Um, it, it, it's about measuring things. It's about, um, you know, quantitative targets, um, it, it, you know, and that's often at, at a really large scale for the, the types of modeling that, that probably most of you do. Um, but it's all, also down to that really micro scale in terms of the, the in-field experiments to, to understand emissions from different sources. But on the adaptation side, the research has very often been social research, qualitative research. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with doing more quantitative adaptation research, but when you look at the body of, of adaptation research, it is largely social because, because really adaptation itself is a social change process. Uh, we've realized that, that for any given technology, that's that's usually a sort of short-term solution with the, the trajectory of unfortunately increasing climate change. The challenge of adaptation is how we gear ourselves up to change and change and change again and, and be quite adaptive or even proactive in the face of, of, of the, you know, this trajectory of climate change. And so that really changes the, the decision-making processes that we use um, to, to respond to the environment around us. And, and that's been dominated by, by social and qualitative type approaches to understand what those are and how we can shift them. So very different research modalities. Then of course, given that the research modalities are quite different, the inputs to those are gonna be quite different. Uh, so on the side of mitigation, um, in a sense, it's fortunate that there are, there are quite measurable goals that can be set. We can measure um, scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. We can set quantitative targets in terms of, of reducing emissions. And what that means is that the inputs into the research um, are often, you know, they're very data driven and they're often big data um, because we need to do this at very large scales. In contrast for adaptation, the, the goals themselves are, are very hard to quantify. They're often process goals, right? Or, or building capacity type goals, right? The goal of building adaptive capacity. How do you quantify that? How do you put data behind that? That's very difficult. Um, there, they might be systems goals, creating qualities in a system like resilience. Um, we've learned over time that that successful adaptation is usually very locally contextual. It fits in with the, the social, cultural systems um, in place in a particular um, locality. And so, so the, the inputs from the, for the research are, are often local insights. There's often the use of participatory processes to bring together multiple forms of information and knowledge in a particular place. So, so those ways of, of, of getting the inputs into the research process themselves are, are quite different between mitigation and adaptation. If we then look at that engagement, that brokering, the marketing side of research, um, we, we again see some pretty big differences. Um, so when it comes to, to mitigation, there's been a real dominance, and I don't expect you to read these graphs, they're just there to give an impression. <laughs> um, there's been a sort of dominance of, of quite 
technical communication. We want people to know the technical detail. We want decision makers to really engage with, with you know, with what some of these specific technical issues really, really mean. But on the adaptation side, the engagement, the communication is often a tool in the social change process itself. So you see a lot of the kind of engagement taking um, much more kind of novel, um, pictorial, emotive um, sort of forms. So, you know, there's this wonderful theater company, One Small Bag in Vanuatu, um, that have sort of specialized in, in theater and film as a vehicle for social change. And so they've got some theater productions, they've got a feature film that are about, you know, responding to climate in an adaptation sense. Climate adaptation often then uses images to convey the results of the research, um, rather than trying to convey the sort of technical detail of social research, um, which often just gets labeled by everyone as being full of jargon and not very helpful, even though the same is true on the on the quantitative, um, you know, sort of mitigation side. Uh, but but the world is a little bit more geared up to um, to embrace um, quantitative jargon as opposed to social science jargon. And then lastly, of course, what matters is how all these things are feeding to decision makers um, and, and who is making those decisions and how. And so on that consumer end of research, again, we have some real differences between mitigation and adaptation. So on the mitigation side, um, there, there are certain um, processes and structures that have been set up. So, you know, through the United Nations processes, mitigation is, is managed, hopefully, through nationally determined contributions. Um, there's there's a, a propensity to set quantitative targets, um, to manage these through policy and regulation, or sometimes through um, market mechanisms, right, to earn carbon credits um, and trade carbon credits. And what this means is that the decision makers that you're, you're trying to influence with research or you're, you're trying to get research to reach are, are often policy makers. And when it comes to mitigation, if it's mitigation in agriculture, that responsibility has often been devolved to agricultural policy makers. Um, it's held in ministries and departments of agriculture. And also trying to reach large businesses um, so that we can get the, the quickest, biggest mitigation benefit possible in the shortest amount of time. In contrast, on the adaptation side, well, adaptation is managed through national adaptation plans, which are a, quite a different sort of structural mechanism. Um, because it's about social and practice change, because it's often about local land management choices, then the mechanisms are are processes to support those changes. They're, they're, you know, maybe government or donor support programs that help to make those changes happen at local levels. And so the decision makers, the consumers that we're trying to reach with our research are different as well. They're, they're program designers, much more so than policy makers usually. Um, often when it comes to adaptation, that has not been necessarily devolved to an agricultural ministry. It's often still at a kind of cross-sectoral level, maybe even a, an environment ministry. Um, and, and, and because it's trying to reach local communities, it's trying to reach the most vulnerable often, uh, that, that's radically different than reaching, say, large businesses, and involves a series of intermediaries, often NGOs and civil society organizations. So what I hope I've done is painted you a picture of, of what I almost call a tale of two universes. The whole research value chain that has built up around mitigation and the whole research value chain that has built up around adaptation, they just look and feel very different and, and, and they're designed to reach what are still often quite different decision makers. And it reminds me of that, um, that sort of classic, even though it may not be entirely scientifically true, um, but that, that classic sense of left brain versus right brain, right? So, so mitigation is, is very um, technical, data-driven targets, policies, um, whereas adaptation is, 
is social process change, very local, very supportive in an ongoing kind of way. Um, and, and those two universes have evolved for, for very good reasons, particularly when, when you look at the nature of the problem and the challenge and the nature of the decision makers that we're trying to reach. However, that those different value chains for the two types of, of research mean that bridging that gap, that synergizing, um, can seem like an urgent, but also very, very big challenge. So we've said it's critical to pursue actions that achieve both adaptation and mitigation. And I would add development in a developing country context which is different than adaptation. So these are all distinct goals. And a wide gulf really has developed between the ways of working and taking action for these different goals. That's not necessarily a criticism, but it does mean that if we're gonna synergize, if we're gonna create co-benefits in the real world, all the way through from research down to decision makers, then we need to be thinking about how we actively and consciously bridge those two universes like like doing exercises where you start small and you build the muscles you know until it starts to seem natural and interestingly if if i go back to my left brain right brain analogy um there are suites of exercises that have been developed and are, are advocated specifically because evidence shows they build neurological connections between the left brain and the right brain. And these exercises are called cross crawls. And they involve using your limbs to, to deliberately reach across the midline of your body. And, um, and I would say, I think you wouldn't do it, but I would say if you have room where you're standing right now, you know, get up and do some cross crawls, like reach across your body um, and with multiple limbs to practice reaching across that midline. Um, because what I'm gonna say now is that when it comes to, to climate and co-benefits, I think that's the way we need to think about it. I think we need to do climate cross crawls. We need to actively exercise the muscles of reaching from one area of research, one set of decision makers into the other. And just like with exercises, you often need to start small and build up from there. So we can do that. We can, we can make sure that we're constantly challenging ourselves to read papers that we wouldn't normally read, um, that maybe come with language that confuses us at first. We can then reach out to some of the people who write these papers and talk really deeply with them. Um, and I would say just talk deeply with someone different from you. I've, I've created, you know, a bit of a maybe black and white adaptation versus mitigation. But the important thing is to think about, you know, if you're very quantitative, reach out to someone who's very qualitative and learn what their research world is like approach those conversations with an attitude of, of yes and, rather than an attitude of no, but because we can have a tendency and we're often trained in science to, to be very critical, um, but we need really big collaboration here. And part of that is, is trusting that our peers have expertise, even if we don't understand it, even if it doesn't fit within our mental models. So we can say, ah, yes, I, I see what you're trying to do. And let me share what I'm trying to do. And let's find where they come together. I would say, then, as we get a little bit more advanced in our exercises, we need to focus on the consumers. We need to focus on those decision makers. If we can help them build shared visions between mitigation and adaptation, then the research value chains that we pursue, the research methodologies and inputs and everything, they might be able to remain very different and, and, and true to the nature of the different goals, as long as they're converging when it comes down to that consumer end of the value chain. And we should really look for, we should make, pay lots of attention to exactly who has the power to make what decisions. And if we find those decision makers who have the ability to support um, those, those both mitigation and adaptation decisions, 
then we need to make sure our research supports them. And finally, I think we do need to consider new blended research engagement policy approaches. Um, you know, that, that, that's a whole area of, of innovation to me in that middle um, between, between the two kind of ways of working. Um, we shouldn't do a lot of what I see happening, which is, you know, someone from one, you know, kind of way of working tries to force the other goal to be characterized in their modality. So don't force adaptation to, to give you big data for a, a standard mitigation model. Find those, those blended modalities. And I would say to you, that's, that's how I interpret the concept of radical collaboration, how we reach across and work with people who do research in an entirely different way than, than what we might, um, and, and, and try to find those bridges and those ways to connect and do that right across the value chain. So we're understanding the decision makers and how to bridge them as well. And, and so I would encourage everyone to, to think about engaging in radical collaboration as the solution for synergizing adaptation and mitigation. And I know that's something you're going to talk about a little bit more tomorrow. So I, I hope I've given you a slightly different type of talk than what you might normally hear at AgMIP, uh, and that you'll be able to take this not, in, not just into the conversations this afternoon, but into a, an engaging day tomorrow. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Veronica. This was really inspiring and a really nice uh, twist uh, to, to the topic. Uh, while people maybe collect their thoughts for two or three questions we can have right now. Um, I understand this a bit like a call for ten in the tendency, a little more qualitative research on mitigation aspects and maybe more quantitative research on, on adaptation. But uh, I think you made your, your point clear. So um, yeah, questions, please. Yes, please. And please say your name and your affiliation here. Well, thanks very much, Veronica. My name is Mike Rivington from the James Hutton Institute based in Scotland. Um, I wouldn't disagree with anything that you said, but also wondered where your perspective was on impact, because we always think of mitigation, adaptation, and impacts. So I just wonder what sort of um, cross-crawl exercise you'd get to get a third dimension in there as well. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very true. Um, so, so, so I guess my for much of my career, I've 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 worked at the cross crawl area of impacts and adaptation, um, and a lot of of what I'd say there is that um, is that certainly when it comes to adaptation, um, ever ever deeper understanding of impacts is is not necessarily helpful for decision making. So we think. We often think of it as a one-to-one -one relationship, understand the impact and then, you know, adapt exactly to it. But because adaptation is this challenge of, of constantly shifting our decision making, um, if we do it in direct response to impact research, then, then we're always kind of behind the game. So, so I sort of think of it a, a little bit like the, the same way I'm advocating almost a kind of um, soft connection, right, between mitigation and adaptation, I think the same should be true for impacts. I think impacts research does a great job helping people, like, think clearly about the nature of the challenge that we're facing, but it doesn't necessarily directly then kind of quantitatively influence exactly what we should do about it. Um, so we need that that picture in there of, of the, the nature of the world that we're likely to be facing without action. Um, but, but, you know, embrace that in a sort of, you know, okay, like that's really helpful. And now some mitigation is really helpful. And now some adaptation is really helpful. And usually the impacts, um, you know, the, the advantage there is, is that research needs to reach both types of decision makers. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Yes, please. Hello, Veronica. My name is Sig Snap from CIMIT and uh, really appreciated your talk. I might try and get you to give it one to some of my scientists, but I just wanted to say that this reminds me a lot of the age-old 
participatory action research, which has been my happens to be something I've worked a lot in. How do we scale? Is how we talk about it a lot now, right? And so one of the directions I'd love you to comment on is this idea instead of prescriptive scaling, uh, adaptive, you know, we this is how you should in this area, a decision tool like a digital uh, decision tree, instead more about agency, like how do you promote better agency through knowledge, through, through promoting people's own innovation? Do you think that's one of the ways forward in terms of adaptation? How do we scale adaptation? I'd love to hear your comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so, so I think we need both of what you've talked about, right? So, um, so there's a fair bit of the adaptation community, yeah, that talks about, you know, um, you know, really doing kind of the fundamental things that empower people, right? But even if I feel like empowered to make my own decisions, if I don't really understand what the heck I need to respond to, particularly in a proactive way, I'm not necessarily going to make better decisions. So I think we still need to use processes. So I think it's 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 both empowerment and decision making processes that need to scale. I think part of the problem is what we've been trying to do is scale technology. Um, so we're we're trying to take a a, a specific solution and get it spread widely over you know millions and millions of farmers when it might not fit their local contexts so i'd like to think that scaling is about um some of those you know addressing some of those root causes of of vulnerability that help people feel empowered um and have the resources right so in a developing country context it, it it's often that you know you you just don't have the basic resources to to devote time to decision making so let's get that sorted and let's see how government programs, NGOs, uh, civil society organizations can be um, can be all kind of uh, sharing and spreading um, some of these adaptation decision making processes that people themselves can follow. Thanks, Veronica. We have time for one more short question and short answer, please. We have to move on, but okay. we can come back in the panel later to this. Hi, Veronica, but, Cynthia. So. <laughs> Am I on? Can you hear me? All right. Yes. First of all, quick, quick message. We're working on the final report. <laughs> it's due Friday. Thank you. <laughs> In the midst of all of AgMIP 9, the global workshop. Um, you know, we, we just have, we've been working on uh, synergizing mitigation and adaptation in our in a Bangladesh um, our rice growing uh, systems, um, a pilot project, two things. But the one was the st stakeholder engagement, absolutely critical uh, to really begin just discussing across the two at the same time, because mostly even the stakeholders are very bifurcated on, on, on the two sides. And but here comes the question, guidance for, we, you know, it is, we really tried to link, you know, embed the quantitative and the qualitative in the same project. It was super hard, but we did what we could. But <laughs> any, any, you know, for the, for the next follow on project, how would you say, you know, guidance for really that, that interplay between the quantitative and the qualitative phase? Thanks, uh, Cynthia. So, so I guess um, as as my career has progressed, I've I've gotten more and more and more focused, not on the research but the decisions. So, so starting with like a really really contextual. Well, okay. So, so if Bangladesh rice farmers are going to be engaging in actions that have both mitigation and adaptation benefits. Let's go talk to the rice farmers, right? What's, you know, what are their challenges? What motivates them? You know, what do they, how do they want to change? How do they not want to change? Um, then like, let's really map all the roles uh, that governments see themselves in, in terms of creating that change and then design research that pulls on the levers that are already there. Um, in, in, in terms of the way farmers make decisions, the way government tries to support them. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Veronica. This worked out very nicely, so big round of applause.
I hope you can stay with us uh, on, uh, throughout the panel, but we'll, we'll see. Um, our next speaker is uh, Bruno Basso. Um, he's here with us. Uh, Bruno is a John A. Hanna Distinguished Professor and MSU Foundation Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Michigan, Michigan State University. He's an international renowned agroecosystem scientist and crop systems modeler with interest in long-term sustainability of agricultural systems, digital agriculture, circular bio, uh, bioeconomy. And his research focuses on assessing and modeling spatial and temporal variability of crop yield, soil organic carbon, GHG emission, water and nutrient fluxes across agricultural landscapes under current and future climates. Bruno, the floor is yours. Right. That was a mouthful. <laughs> okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be here and I have the opportunity to share with you uh, my thoughts and I really like to say that I'm bringing uh, not just my personal thoughts but sharing what both farmers and industries are really demanding uh, for us, stakeholders in general. And so it's much more of a uh, real implementation and applications of what we have been discussing over the last 10-15 years with AgMIP. And uh, so we have, uh, it's Pretty well known, this uh, paradox of uh, continue to grow, you know, food, uh, less water, and we have to produce uh, fuels in, uh, in a changing climate. The problem is all about trade-offs, right? So protect soil, water, air quality, uh, decreasing biodiversity losses. Agriculture is one of the major threats for losses of biodiversity, as you probably know. And we need to basically reach negative greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, we have to consider the profit for farmers, right? A revenue streams such that they are incentivized um, in making these changes. Nothing happens just because we tell them they have to be part of the decision making and they have to be able to see, um, you know, the risk quantified, whether it's through carrots or, or uh, sticks. Unfortunately, uh, that's more cross, uh, cross the pond approach. So we lose uh, the additional challenges are the fact that we lose about one, uh, uh, it's the, the analogy, one soccer field, um, 10,000 acres, let's put it that way, 10,000 uh, hectares uh, per day of agricultural land to urbanization. So it's a number that is hard to take it in, but it's a major uh, threat. And deforestation, forest fires, soil erosion, we lose uh, basically um, a... Uh, um, a pound of uh, soil, so imagine that, how much for every, every bushels, every 60 kilograms of corn that is produced in the Midwest. Water quality goes without saying, this is one example in the Great Lakes for excessive use of fertilizer. Now, I wanted to share some of the surprises when I say losing land. These are farmers that we've been monitoring over the years, and one year we went back and the fields wasn't there. It was, there's a subdivision being grown there so that's a commercial field not just one and they're not next to each other so we had yield maps that were commercial farmers and now they are houses and there are more to be converted um, so that's a major threat i wanted to leave let me see can i take this off it takes okay um i work on this and and i didn't know how much of redundancy there was but this is uh, how much agriculture emits, okay? So the emissions for agricultural system are seven gigatons of CO2 equivalent, and they are partitioned on on-farm energy. So there is a significant amount of loss, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, so mitigating. This is critical to understand that, that agriculture is both a victim and a cause of climate change. So that's a really bad position to be in. Um, synthetic fertilizer, rice cultivation, we all know about major uh, contribution from enteric fermentation, manure management, very large impact, and CO2 emitted from residues. But on the food system side, then you have this large component of the land use change, 31%, the food and transport, and, and so that's, you know, scaled. And so the question is, okay, how are we going to help farmers to basically mitigate while at the same time they need to adapt? One important thing, farmers adapt by definition. 
they always are exposed. Their business depends on weather. So they adapt on short term, like strategic, making decision for the cultivars that they buy, the investment that they make. And they also have adaptation tactical within the season. If they're gonna go out and spray, if it's they look at the weather forecast. So that type of uh, scaling, temporal scaling, it's much more familiar to them. The problem is about changing the management such that they reduce the emissions, okay? So in terms of, you know, we know it's carbon dioxide, everything is converted to carbon dioxide through global, you know, the warming potentials. And so methane is 36 times more powerful, nitrous oxide 265 more powerful. And so of each of the components that you saw, which molecule is more, uh, stays longer in the atmosphere, is more potent. And so basically 50% of the, 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 the emissions of agriculture is through fertilizers, through N2O. And so a technical potential, this from a recent paper that uh, Lorenzo De Rosa and Paolo um, Gabrielli did. And so on-farm energy use could be reduced. How can that happen? Through conservation tillage, less passes. Through digital agriculture, less numbers of basically agrochemicals, different quality type of uh, amendments. And uh, synthetic fertilizer, precision agriculture, putting the right amount, the right place, the 4R. And, and so this has been quantified. But recently, we also published a paper in PNS where we showed basically the technology that is available now versus the one that is available in between th three and 15 years and decarbonizing the economy through the Oberbosch and, and generating energy on the farm is obviously a longer term, more ambitious, but you can reach up to 70 percent um, emissions in uh, maintaining unfortunately, the number of animals and livestock and so on. Now the question is on a field scale, can we, what have we learned? And so one opportunity that we have at Michigan State is the long-term, the Kellogg Biological Station long-term ecological sites. And so a very detailed analysis, we've done the global warming potential. This work is led by Phil Robertson. And so conventional tillage, maize is an emitting crop versus uh, a no tillage management plus cover crop there is a sequestration so there is a negative emissions carefully quantified now, now the thing that i want to show about the importance of long-term research is that if you compare the cost and the benefits of going from conventional tillage to no till it takes 16 years before you see a benefit of 100 dollars per hectare per year and so farmers, unfortunately, unless this is the critical piece of incentivize the co-benefits, they have to stick with the plan because often they engage into a management change and then they return back to the same operation. So they go back and retail the soil. So that's one critical things that we not have done successfully in the past. And because two reasons, one, you run out of incentives. There are not enough money to continue to support. And so the opportunity that we have in front of us is to carbon markets, to markets and to basically making the climate smart commodity. As you probably have learned, the US government has invested $3 billion just on adopting uh, practice adoptions, okay? Paying farmers to adopt and remaining into the system with that. And that's through regenerative agriculture, just to emphasize the connection between the uh, um, health, one health, you know, the health of the environment, the health of the food, the health of the people. And you can see connecting, we have a center for regenerative agriculture, highly funded from both private and, pu uh, and public partnership. So conventional practice is very well known. They create, the, they are emitting, they lose uh, water runoff, erosion versus the one where you basically retain the carbon, you build the um, aggregate stability, you hold more water, and you're allowed to return, you know, carbon residues and so on. So that's the, one of the major changes we have to push for is the diversity of crops, which is obviously not happening too much. Continuous still, all year farmers should be incentivized and paid for the number of days the fields are green rather than brown, because that's a proxy for CO2 sequestration and returning carbon through the roots and the residues. Precision inputs, why putting excessive amount of fertilizer with all the life cycle analysis and the carbon intensity that is these excessive emissions come from 
inefficient use of those. Livestock integration, a, pre a critical piece. There is culture behind meat. The meat will never disappear. It needs to be integrated into crop and livestock. Uh, from this is a, a, a long debate with economists at the moment, you know, they think the current system is very efficient from an economic point of view, but it's not necessarily efficient from an environmental point of view. And so landscape diversity and all the benefits that you well aware. So one of the things that you may know this organization field to market and field to market is I'm using it as an example. It's it's basically an NGO that supports the mandate on sustainability of over 200 members from Pepsi, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, you name it, all the food, all the seed companies, and they are demanding a standardized way of quantifying sustainability. Okay, so the question is, what are we doing about that to help, you know, basically bring some of the science into the mix? And so the, 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 the matrix are not just soil carbon, it's land use, soil conservation, soil carbon, irrigation, that's why I had water, nutrient, and climate, you know, resources, water quality. And so depending on the different types, you got this level of things on the left. What do they use currently? They use simple multiplier. So there are lots of initiatives, science-based initiative, that's no longer acceptable. You can't say yes or no cover crop and say, per cover crop, you're gonna get this bonus of two tons, you know, sequester. That's far from being true. We will be doing a significant amount of greenwashing if we were to continue to use very weak systems in terms of quantification of the systems and the feedback. So we need to have, has been, you know, discussed a lot, participatory, you know, conversation with stakeholders, be able to use, um, you know, remote sensing images, knowledges of how stable, you know, areas are, you know, high productivity versus low productivity, multi-crop model, ensemble, socioeconomic analysis, trade-off, and you know the rest. Now, what I wanted to share is how can models help in basically help industry quantifying this? So there is this, a mechanism called carbon credits that is currently going on. And there is so much unknown that people say, oh, that doesn't exist and no carbon is not sold. Carbon today are sold at $75 a ton and they are being bought as offsets from you know, BP, Spotify, Microsoft, you name it, from sol carbon. And those are carbon sequestration and offset means they can, it, they're like shares, they can be resold, but they're very rigorous to be quantified because they have to create additionality, permanence, and so long-term contracts, and they're rigorously verified. Now, the rigorously verified is that models have to be validated and independently validated. So the model for full disclosure, I've over time, I've uh, developed technology that was taken from a company. And so Salus that is used by this company is Vera verified, which basically there is an ongoing process. We do a lot of the validation, but there is industries eager to see, okay, you can't just say I've used, you know, Walter's model, who's Walter, you know? So we have to be able to get the verification. And so that's happening. And this community is not necessarily well aware of independent validation. So you can't just change, you know, and calibrate, tweak the numbers. There is a body that will run the model and will validate, go through the report that you're going to be doing. And so the agreement is 20% is sole sampling, 80% is modeling. Now, is one model sufficient? Far from being true, because what we have seen in the next few things. So you have payment for carbon sequestration, payment for practice adoption. Just farmers, for example, Pepsi, I'm on the advisory board for, of sustainability for Pepsi, has invested 250 million to give it to farmers to plant cover crops. They are verified and they claim the benefits from cover crop as avoided emissions in the scope three. So what you have seen the, along the supply chain, and, and through the, uh, again, avoided emissions. Now, the uncertainties, unfortunately, all the titles are cut off for some reason. Uncertainty was the title. Soil sampling, you go on one side and you get uh, one part of the field, you get a value. You go two days later, two meters away, you get a different value. Obviously, it's not because of the two days, but it's just because there is the spatial variability we have to deal with. Carbon and greenhouse gas emissions modeling is why we're here and what we're doing about it. 
And then the verification and protocols, there is a new sets of rules through carbon intensity quantification, life cycle analysis. And, and so, as I mentioned today, as a negotiation, it's a $75 a ton, even though the natural climate solution like the forestry credits are only sold at $5 a ton. So agriculture is really in the mix because it really helps because of the production of the food, in, improved biodiversity if you bring cover crops and so on. The other thing is we detect tillage practices from satellites. So this is daily images at three meter resolution. So those are the days that they're flying. There's very little that we cannot see anymore on a field. And I'm collaborating with a company that is launching this low altitude satellite shoebox that will have 10 images per day, 20 centimeter resolution, hyperspectral in the next two years. So things are completely changing and we have to link the geospatial information to improve inputs that go into the model. And so that's one example. The, the, the other critical piece that modeling plays a role is in the MMRV, measuring, monitoring, reporting and verification. The way we, it works is, again, you can't send people to say, that, was it a cover crop or was it a no tillage? So you detect from remote sensing computer vision and satellite. You combine the practices, the soil weather, we basically, what we do, we build the input, you run the model, you verify the practice change, and you model the regenerative potentials, and then farmers are rewarded based on this. This is the scheme that currently goes on. Now you can have offsets or insets, just briefly, offsets are the one like real shares, insets are only within the same supply chains. But those are still the most powerful, the most common one, but they are the ones that can really be greenwashed because they are claimed and also they should be changing the emissions on scope one and scope two, and they don't do anything about that, and so they use the opportunity to reduce emissions through that. But interestingly, you may know this, the label of sustainable produced or something is no longer going to be allowed. In Europe next year, that labeling of produced with sustainable agriculture is not going to be uh, allowed unless it's produced with certifications and with real quantification. So there is a movement. I know some of you are very well, but that's what I work on. I was very pleased and I thank Cynthia for giving me this opportunity because it is really a gift for the modelers to get involved into this type of applications and how we do that. So claiming is, is critical. Sustainability claims are going to be under scrutiny more and um, is, is uh, for example, the electronic uh, notebooks are going to be mandatory to be uploaded in the European Union in exchange of the PAC, the, pu the public policy, uh, common uh, agricultural policy to receive the incentives. So the farmers have to report how many passes, how, what fertilizer they use, what they have done. Now they can cheat, obviously, not with the level of remote sensing that is happening. And, and it's the same way, okay, you're supposed to pay taxes and the Italians don't pay uh, taxes all the time. And there's still, there's, there is a, li a limit to what you can do even with remote sensing. But there is a level of honesty, and, and so that will change also. Okay, so multimodal ensemble. Okay, I'll go really fast. So what we wanted to do different is we run in-house with a converter that the models are all converted in the inputs. They all start with the same level of inputs, same initialization of the pools. And so this is open to any other model. Salus, Epic, Descent, Cropsist, Armosa, and... Uh, uh, APSIM is missing. Anyway, so we plan to build APIs for the public use, so available freely to the public with uh, this approach. And this is an example of how more technical components of the talk is like, can multimodels capture the benefits of going from conventional tillage to uh, no-till and cover crops? And is one model better than two? So these are the inputs that we used, and there was quite of uh, creative approaches that you know my lab members Tommaso Tadiello is here present, and Fidel uh, Maureria uh, both attended, and they worked really hard to get this, some of these slides ready. So each of the bands in terms of geolocation have different maturity group. So the level of details are represented that, that the farmers will understand that they are, we're reproducing the fields and the cultivars and the management. 
So this is an example of running an ensemble mean now between conventional that lo loses salt carbon versus no tillage on the right. And the numbers are very reliable in the sense what we expect with the literature, no time and, or space to put it, but no till sequesters 250 kgs, about one ton of CO2 equivalent uh, per year. And so this is the example, because especially each model performs differently for some reason. And so you have model one, model two, where you lose, and some models shows that conventional tillage lose, some models shows that there is a benefit. So go figure, and, but the thing is the ensemble gets better. So this is a comparison again of the different models, especially with the no-till. Just, I don't want to blow you with the numbers, but I want to show you that no-till, so if field to market were to use the benefits of converting after five years, conventional till has lost 0.400 kilograms of CO2 versus uh, 1.5 was a sequester in the no-till. And then after 10 years, this is useful if you see the number in parentheses, how the models diverge over time. The divergence over time gets bigger. So if you use the models between five or 10 years, they started all of the same conditions, the envelope is a little bit smaller and can be used to quantify um, this assessment. These are for different, but just to show consistency about no-till sequestering versus conventional losing. So last slides, technology, when I say digital agriculture, I don't mean just precision agriculture, but I mean both the sensors, the robotics, the modeling, the AI, the economic uh, analysis and farm level tools, remote sensing, the integration and capturing using plants and as a sentinel, as indicators of spatial variation, where the samples, how to place fertilizer differently. Farmers got the biggest attention when profitability map was shown in front of them, where they were making money, where they're losing money. We have farmers that they get paid to remove low productivity areas into pollinators. Sequestering carbon, they, they get payment for sequestering carbon and the biodiversity benefits. Then we have landscape and data tools all the way to policy implementation. And so with that, I just wanted to thank the members that uh, work hard with me, patient, and uh, thank you very much indeed for your attention. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Bruno. Very interesting. Again, we have time for two or three short questions, uh, please. And I would also like to um, ask you to maybe respond to the question, where is this aspect of synergies between adaptation and mitigation? This was a lot about mitigation, but I Perfect. think there are some obvious linkages here. So we have a question by Christoph here in the center. Thanks, Bruno. Great work. Christoph Müller, Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. When you force models to have the same initial conditions to start off with, what you will see is there are different mismatches between the equilibrium state and their rates. So what you get that one is beneficial and the other one finds it's not is because, or I think is likely because their turnover rates and their sensitivity to soil moisture and temperature is different and therefore the starting point fits their rates better or worse. So you could try alternatively to find an equilibrium point that's model specific and then go from conventional to no-till from there. Mm. Are you referring to the pool sizes of carbon? Okay. Yeah, pool yeah. sizes. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean that they initialize with the same number. Each model has, sometimes they have two pools, some other models have five pools. So that's accounted. And we also do that level of parameterization with the owners of the models. So it's not just us. So we say, you know, we have three fresh organic matter pools and three, you know, organic. So those are, you know, starting conditions need to speed up and, you know, spin up that is different from another model. So that what you're saying is accounted. They don't just plug in by brute force that they need to do, you know, this number. It's what what is the closest of capturing the level of microbial activity in the pool sizes or humic form and so each of models behaves differently beforehand to reach to that point thank you bruno eric Jus from uh, from france uh, i would like to know if uh, the variability around the result you obtain i saw in the in the table is compatible with uh, uh, advice to uh, uh, to give the possibility to have payment for farmers 
is it realistic with such a variability to to say yes you will store four ton of carbon per hectare uh, around for 10 years uh, when i saw the the large variability are people who are doing payment aware of that or not so at the moment in order for the model that is used the single model has to have a 20 percent uncertainties accepted otherwise it's not going to be released it's not going to be used so these numbers after five years were lower than that the standard deviation was lower than uh, the mean the ensemble mean so um, bruno uh, claudio stockel washington state university uh, just as a comment bruno I don't know how many of the models are actually considering an increase in oxidation during the period of tillage. And that will carry at least for a week or two, depending on when the soil is stabilized again based on rainfall and that. So that, that could be a significant factor mm -hmm. in the direction of the change. So I sure, don't, I don't, we have I to look in each, each single model has a different routines to do things. Yes. But sometimes it's not even included. The fact that you, you increase the, you open the system with the Tillage. Of course. And then you get faster decay rates during that period. Yes. And I don't know how well that's captured. That, something to investigate because we know yes. that's a problem. It could be easy to resolve somewhat. Yeah. Well, I mean, the CO2 evolution is a result of the sequestration. So that's accounted as the delta between where you started and where you end up. So the five years changes capture all the CO2 that is emitted. So the pool sizes are account for that. All right, thanks, uh, Bruno. We'll have you later back on the panel and there may be room for more questions. Thanks everyone and a round of applause for Bruno, please. Okay, we are going into the panel now and I'm calling on uh, Apurbo Chaki uh, to come up to the panel. Yes, Apurbo uh, is a senior scientific officer at the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute and also an honorary research fellow at the School of Agriculture and Food Sciences at the University of Queensland in Australia. Um, Apurbo conducts research on sustainable cropping system intensification, cropping system modeling and climate smart agriculture. He has a strong research collaboration with CSIRO University of Queensland, Visa, Columbia University, University and uh, CIMIT. And Apurbo, I would ask you for your introductory comments. Make presentation. Yeah. Uh, all together. Okay. Uh, thank you, Herman, for introducing me. Uh, so, uh, like I'm, I'm from Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute in Bangladesh. So, I'll share some of my uh, like thoughts and lesson learned during our recently completed uh, MACB project that's funded by ACR and led by Columbia University. So, so that's the uh, like climate is uh, changing and it's, it's impacting uh, the agriculture sector. So like two lines of defense, uh, that's the mitigation, that's reducing the emissions of uh, greenhouse gas and enhancing the things and, and adaptation, that's reducing vulnerability and enhancing resilience. So the, the, the uh, synergies with, uh, uh, between the uh, mitigation and adaptations is really important. So like according to the claim at uh, 2005, that's the synergies in, in climate policy uh, are created uh, when measures that control atmospheric GHG concentrations and also reduces adverse effects of uh, climate change or vice versa. So such measures have uh, the ancillary benefits uh, which produced the win-win situations. So uh, a little bit introduction uh, about Bangladesh's perspective, like how mitigation and 
adaptation research are going on, like what policies we have. So uh, according to the World Climate Risk Index uh, 2021, Bangladesh ranked the seventh on the list of the countries most vulnerable to climate change. Uh, however, the, it only contributes a small share of total global emissions, like if we really uh, consider the uh, like total emissions from all sectors. And climate change, uh, like due to its geographic locations, uh, there's the flat and low-lying top topography, the climate change induced natural disasters plague Bangladesh to uh, uh, like lots of climate induced uh, disasters we are we are facing in the agriculture sector and uh, the uh, high population density uh, poverty and resilience on climate sensitive sectors for water and food security increases its vulnerability to uh, climate change so the the national adaptation plan this this uh, uh, but done in, in 20, uh, 2022 uh, for 2023 and to 2050. So like the, the Bangladesh government has uh, uh, like published its national adaptation plans, which uh, focuses six uh, like visions where the development of climate resilient uh, um, agriculture for food and nutrition and livelihood security is uh, the, uh, one of the important visions. And, ensuring transformative capacity building and, and innovation for climate change adaptations uh, is uh, also a, one of the uh, important NAB visions to uh, mitigate and adapt, uh, adapted adaptation to climate change. So while we are talking about the adaptation and mitigations from the Bangladesh perspective, so RICE is the uh, one like, it has both, uh, you know, like the staple food for uh, the Bangladeshi people. Uh, so it has a major uh, food security role uh, and, and as well as uh, income security for the rural populations in, in Bangladesh. And uh, so any uh, a negative change in the productivity of rice will badly impact the food security uh, of the population of that country. So uh, rice, uh, rice is grown uh, like two to three times a year, mainly rice and rice is the dominant cropping pattern in, in Bangladesh. So rice, in grown, rice is grown in the wet season, that's the mainly rain-fed rice, and it also grown in the uh, like winter season, that's the dry season, so mostly uh, irrigated one. So the rice rice, uh, like rice rice cropping system, uh, uh, cropping systems is the major cropping pattern covering uh, like most of the uh, part of the Bangladesh. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, our experience in of the MACB project. So, so we evaluated the uh, rice production systems. There's the dry season rice and uh, three management uh, strategies we have uh, simulated. There's the con conventional continuous flood, that's farmers are practicing. And then the intervention is conventional with alternate waiting and drying and system of rice intensification with alternate and waiting and drying and three uh, uh, climate projections so uh, the some of the key findings from our uh, projects is climate change reduces farm net returns in most sites uh, uh, adoption of conventional uh, alternate waiting and drying or uh, sri with awd under current and future climate shows strong reductions in in greenhouse gas emissions so both uh, conventional AWD and SRI uh, show potential co-benefits uh, in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions as well as increasing uh, the like, farm income. That's the winning out winning outcomes uh, of these interventions. And uh, AWD and SRI are likely to be the more resilient to climate change compared to uh, continuous flood system. So. Uh, this is the key findings. Uh, tomorrow, we'll, uh, Shonali and uh, Roberto will uh, talk uh, more about in the dedicated mitigation and adaptation paper sessions. So you are welcome uh, in that uh, presentation sessions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Apurvo. And uh, we call on our second uh, panelist, uh, who is Mariana Rufino from the Technical University in Munich. She studies the interactions between crop livestock uh, and forests, combining modeling and experimentation 
She's a professor of livestock systems at the Technical Uni University, and her aim is to advance the theoretical understanding of the processes determining productivity and env environmental performance of the livestock sector to design alternative futures. Mariana. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm going to share a couple of thoughts and um, disclaimer is that these thoughts are for a community of ag modelers. Uh, I want to talk about synergies uh, between adaptation and mitigation specifically for the livestock sector. And we know the livestock sector takes a big share of the greenhouse gas uh, balance. Um, and livestock can be seen from the sinks and from the sources. And for us to find the space to find this synergy, we need, we actually still need to quantify to, to be, uh, to do a, a better job with models to be able to identify that space, that sweet spot for mitigation and adaptation. And for, for models to be able to do that, they have to go through this long list of things they have to do better. Productivity, including stress. So models are getting there, but not yet there. And we also have to have health and welfare, emissions, um, nitrogen emissions, do phosphorus balance, productivity, biodiversity, and interactions. A lot to do, but there is a lot of development that could help us do a better job. We can embrace data science and, and sensing technology so we can make progress as we go. Um, from the mitigation perspective, there is a lot of experimental research, testing different feeds and, and thinking how to manage manure. And we can use that information from the mitigation research as it comes. And that research can also easily be included into, into models. Doing the things, and now I'm talking about grasslands, I'm talking about the global grasslands, the natural grasslands, diverse grasslands in the tropics and the subtropics, that is more difficult. And there is a lot of debate on what to do with grasslands, a lot of debate about changing diets and so on. I want to show you recent compelling evidence, and this is what you have on the screen now, of a very well-designed experiment where they show, they show, and I want you to direct your eyes to, do I have a pointer? Go to the lower corner, because I want to show you this, is, this was an experiment where, where they compare fertilization effects, grazing effects, and they wanted to unravel the mechanisms. So they, they uh, put some lights, you can see on the, on the, the sheep with the lights, so LED lights, because they wanted to see whether the grazing effect on biodiversity was uh, the effect of prediction competition and if, whether it could be, um, uh, the effect of grazing could be simulated by adding light. So this graph that you have here is compelling evidence that grazes, grazing increases diversity. You can see it here. So there is a drop in diversity when the plots are fenced and when you add the light, hmm, the, the, the yellow spot, um, biodiversity is restored. So why I'm talking about biodiversity when the, when the session was about mitigation and adaptation? Well, I'm talking about biodiversity because there are very few unique experiments showing, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking you to the lower panel, they're showing you you need to go on for 20 years to show that when you have diverse grasslands, you store more carbon. So in these experiments that are actually uh, in the Cedar Creek uh, Ecosystem Reserve in Minnesota, they show that after 20 years, the grasslands that have more than eight species store significantly more carbon. That is carbon, that's mitigation. But back to adaptation, we also know that diverse grasslands have some species that are not consumed by livestock that store a lot of water. These sort of mechanisms are not yet in models or they are poorly described in models. So if we are going to identify practices in the livestock sector that increase the size of the sink or 
have make an, a more effective use of the sink, we need to understand this. And unfortunately, most of these evidence come from temperate grasslands. So there is a lot of work to do, but we can make progress as we go. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Mariana. Um, very interesting. And uh, now I don't know, Francesco Tubiello, um, are you online? Yes, I see you on the list here. Um, so, Francisco, are you going to say a few introductory words? I was yes, sorry, yes. I, I managed uh, the technology. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, let me briefly introduce you. So, Francesco uh, is with the FAO Statistics Division in uh, Rome. He is a team leader on environmental statistics development for the PowerStat data on land, fertilizers, pesticides, greenhouse gases, and ang agri environmental indicators, and what also works on environmental uh, economic accounting the SDG process and uh, capacity development. So Francisco, you have five minutes for your introductory remarks. Thank you very much uh, for having me and apologies for not being able to be with you. It would have been great, uh, but we'll make do with, with what we have. Um, well, I just wanted to share a few thoughts um, based on, you know, on my experience as a, as a person who's looked uh, on both aspects of adaptation and mitigation with, with Cynthia. I think we wrote early papers on exactly the concept of the synergies. Um, thanks to Bruno Basso, who actually showed already some of my emission slides in which I'm going to present <laughs> again on Friday. I made up a slide as I was listening to uh, the presentations, which I'm going to attempt to share, if I, if I may. Uh, and just please let me know if you see my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay. So, well, I wanted to bring the attention of, of the discussion to a sense of urgency. Uh, and so I titled this, this slide made really at the last moment, so bear with me for the quality of it, synergies and, and urgencies, right? Um, urgency because some of the first, you know, milestone, you know, some of, uh, lampposts or, you know, some of the first milestones that we've set for ourselves, apart from dealing with climate change, which is of course is long-term issue, is goals that we need to reach now. NDCs have been mentioned several times by 2030. Uh, mind you, we are the middle of 2023, so not, not a lot of time left. But we're actually claiming that to turn around uh, our climate change problem, we need to reduce our emissions by about 50% between now and then, okay? So you see in, in the upper left corner of my slide there what I was gonna really talk about, but as I said, Bruno sort of covered that. Um, and so I'm just gonna point to uh, what I was gonna say about data, right? Because we talk about, um, you know, synergies and urgencies, but but then the, what the data, uh, the ones that we produce at FAO are data that are country specific. So they allow you to uh, paint a picture that it's country specific because at the end, you know, you know all, all, all actions will be, if not local, at least specific to the countries where they will happen. So the sort of data that we produce at FAO you know, allow you not just to paint the global picture, which is the slide that you see there, but also different pictures country by country. <clears throat> and what is important, and this is a parenthesis, it goes right away. What is, is important to realize is that we're talking about uh, food systems. So the entire chain that was mentioned in the opening discussion between farm, you know, land use and, 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 and supply chains, is that every country sits along this, this, this continuum in, in different ways. In particular, uh, the trend over the last 10 years has been a significant increase of emissions along supply chains. So when we talk about mitigation, um, you know, every country has, has a certain different makeup. So there is no particular, you know, there is no specific one 
uh, solution that will fit all. But having put that aside and just going back to the what I wanted to talk about in terms of urgency, we have this mitigation goal, uh, goals to reduce <clears throat> our emissions significantly. And of course, the things that we're doing from a perspective of the science and research that we carry out, we've heard through uh, Bruno Basso and, and the others, is to you know, bring to bear all this knowledge uh, and go one step beyond by using the models. And I'm trying to say something that is also hopefully useful to the AgMIP community to, to sort of quantify, you know, with uncertainty, the outcomes of specific actions so that they can be either rewarded or at least uh, being considered by decision makers. The problem is, and this is how I see actually the synergies right now in the terms of urgency, that we have all this laundry list of things that we know work well, and we actually have now models to sort of, you know, put the, uh, you know, a, 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 some sort of certainty to, to payments or to decisions that could be made. But for me, the synergy, uh, it's actually, you know, you can look at it from different perspectives. You start from mitigation, you talk about, and you think about adaptation or vice versa, as, as uh, one of our previous panelists mentioned. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that climate change is marching on, right? Um, in Europe, like in many other parts of the world, you know, talking about agriculture, we are having increasingly serious, not, not just the ones that we were talking about 30 years ago and we only saw in the models, we see them now every day. We have droughts, we're flat, we have temperature uh, and precipitation changes. And those will affect uh, the effectiveness of this. I'm talking now from a mitigation an angle, some of these strategies that have been described by Bruno. So unless we, uh, and, some of them will render them completely ineffective, right? Um, so an angle that for me is important when we talk about synergies of mitigation and adaptation in the context of modeling and of this community is a need to strongly inject those impacts dimensions, you know, as, as the various mitigation modeling strategies are marching along unless, you know, otherwise we'll, will not be very effective and will not be uh, addressing this, 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 this sense of, you know, the urgency that is actually upon us today. Uh, there is climate change, there is also management change. So, so we sorry, hear... Francesco. sorry, Francesco, can you try to wrap up? So we yeah, have... no, no, I, I'm done. Uh, I, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I was just going to add that there's also management changes and some of the solutions we're talking about, no-till, for example, come with specific management uh, you know, packages, uh, which might render the whole solution, maybe from a climate change perspective, useful, but not necessarily from a sustainability pers perspective, think about the need to use lots of herbicides to implement a large scale no-till solution. And I'll stop there and just reminding us that as we talk about this, um, we're not back in 1990 when we had 30 years and we could have acted. Now we have sort of six and a half years, at least to get to the first post that we've set for ourselves. And of course, all the years beyond that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Francesco. Well, well appreciated. What, what you can't see here, all the panelists are back uh, on, the, on the panel here on the table. Uh, and I think you pointed already at some directions. I would pose the challenge to all of the panelists here. Um, what are for AGMAP, for this community, what are research tasks? You know, what are the two priorities people should work on? I think, Francesco, you already gave some good examples. Uh, how do impacts potentially uh, compromise the, some of the mitigation measures? I think that's really interesting. So um, maybe we start with, with, with Bruno. Can you pose like one or two aspects, you know, high priorities for research, research needs or research gaps where the ECMAP community could work on? Oh yeah, you press, press the button, I guess, right? Do we have a, a mic, just a carry on mic? Yeah, mic is coming, just a second. And the audience may already think of some questions. We hopefully we'll get to a round of questions in the end. Yeah, Bruno, please. Right. So 
I think I, I tried to express um, that in, in my presentation is at the moment, there is an opportunity for this community to basically play a role in bringing the rigorous science into the analysis uh, of basically the quantification of the practice adoption. In alternative to a, a modeling system, now whether it's a single model, but hopefully that really goes away because it's, in, it's just impressive to see how different models capture different processes differently and, and you can learn from each other. I mean, sometimes, again, modelers may not know about their particular results that unless they were put in into a comparison. So there is a research stream about improvements of the models as consequences of running them at the same time, parallel with multimodal and some. But on the other side is the opportunity to bring the system because it's only through capturing the, the interaction between the climate, the management, the genetics that you can quantify, you know, what is really happening. In alternative, we have measurements. They are by definition non-scalable, too costly, too variable. They're not to exclude, but they are to be made in a target way that they can function as a validation data sets and improvements for models rather than creating baselines because there will never be a sufficient amount of measurements and so the strategic approach through remote sensing on where you select the sites so the government now is has an opportunity to a significant amount of money from the inflation reduction act here in the us and you have the same pnnr in europe and it's an opportunity to um, get into those conversation because you can bring the science to decide where the new monitoring sites are going to be and where the models could be tested for what scenarios and so in a in a nutshell bring the rigorous science the in selecting sampling for dynamic systems and then bring the possibility of running multiple models to capture the system and work in a synergy you know, with the measurements. I didn't touch the mitigation adaptation. Hopefully, you can come back to that. But it's more about the opportunities that we have. It's yep. a low hanging fruit. Good. Thank you, Bruno. Um, Apogo, what's your two priorities, you know, research needs for Agma? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, like uh, the uh, about the uh, mitigation and adaptation co benefit study so uh, like we are doing uh, like good job uh, doing that but the the uh, i would like to uh, emphasize the application sides of the modeling outputs like uh, so like for the uh, policy makers uh, to show them like how the modeling outputs uh, like we can apply it to really uh, synergizing this uh, mitigation and adaptation co benefits for the like country level perspective so that will be uh, like interesting uh, for the researcher as well as the policy maker and and ultimately benefits the like community yeah thank you thanks apobo mariana so priorities I think we should do a better job at promoting collaboration in livestock system modeling because livestock is a big part of the problem and of the solution. And in general, across the board, all models, I think we cannot afford anymore to be looking either to production or to mitigation or to adaptation or to biodiversity. I think we have to make a bigger effort to include all these aspects because recommendation could be taking systems into the wrong direction. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I'm going back once to Veronica. Veronica, if you're still there, do you have one or two priorities you want to challenge ACMA with? Sure, thank you. Um, I will actually, I'll build on, on Bruno's suggestion around um, uh, sort of getting, getting more nuanced in terms of, of spatial priorities. Um, so, you know, an interesting contrast in a sense between my talk and Bruno's where Bruno said, look, farmers adapt, it's what they do. Um, and I, I don't disagree with that. Um, what we find when we look deeply in the adaptation world is that the nature of the way farmers naturally adapt is, is relatively incremental. It's bounded, right, by, you know, well, I'm a 
rice farmer. So I'm looking for different varieties or, you know, watering strategies. Um, but the nature and the pace and the scale of the impacts means that there are some places that need to look at, you know, entire production system shifts. Um, and, and that's not necessarily within the normal way that farmers make decisions. But let's get really nuanced and spatial about that. Let's understand where um, the impacts mean that that the combination between adaptation and mitigation can really emphasize mitigation because adaptation is something that will happen anyway. Um, and where the way we combine adaptation and mitigation might need to be different because the adaptation decisions need to be quite transformative. Thanks, Veronica. Very, very good. Um, I would uh, ask now for maybe two or three questions or challenges. Yeah. Francesco, if you allow, we, we come back to you at the end, right? So that we then have a last round across the panel. So I'll collect two or three um, comments or questions or challenges, and then we go across the panel again to, to collect some responses. Yes, please, over there. And, and I, if you allow, we go like five minutes into overtime because we also started five minutes late uh, after coffee, <laughs> right? So then we are right net at 90 minutes, please. Eric just uh, from France and Sirat. Uh, thanks, Mariana. I have uh, another idea finally to add to what we need to improve in our cropping system model. We need to improve the possibility to simulate pluri-specific crops or grasslands. Also in our model, since the biodiversity inside the, the field in the very small scale is also a mean to increase apparently the production and then the, the carbon storage at the end in the, in the soil and probably the stability when you have low input system in particular, but perhaps also we need to decrease strongly the inputs and then it's a way to increase the production with a nature-based solution to increase the, the biodiversity inside the, the farmer field. So we need to have models such as soil crop model at the cropping system level and including a highly biodiversity uh, in, this, in, the, in the field, such as we are doing for intercropping, for example, but also for a natural grasslands. So we need also to go further on that. Is it your message, uh, Mariana? Um, my message is that we haven't uh, explored enough in from the livestock systems perspective, we are just starting to explore what biodiversity means for adaptation and mitigation. And I suspect I don't do pure cropping research anymore, but uh, I suspect that we are all also starting to touch the surface of the potential for biodiversity uh, to deliver more benefits from cropping systems. So in general, my message is uh, let's look at different dimensions when we select either mitigation or adaptation or, or ecosystem protecting measures, what they mean in, in, in a different dimension. That's, that was my message. Thanks, Mariana. Are there more questions or comments? Now's the chance, but I acknowledge it has been a long and intensive day. Um, I guess this aspect of the connection between livestock systems and cropping systems, I mean, there's a lot to explore because we know, as Mariana said, right, the challenge is really how to deal with the livestock sector and then getting the emissions down, um, trying to find solutions which, which cater for both. Um, okay, I don't see any hand. Oh, no, two more hands. Okay, let's take two more comments uh, and then we do a quick round uh, uh, across the panel. Uh, um, my name is Valentin Preuf from, from CIRAD. Uh, do you think we should have the same uh, strategies or recommendations in terms of adaptation and mitigation for the agri agricultural systems in countries that where um, the production is close to the potential compared to uh, agricultural systems where there is a, a bigger gap to close to the potential? Thanks, thanks very much. And we take the other comment as well, please. Uh, hello again, uh, Mike Rivington from the James Hutton Institute. Um, model, modeling's made huge advances over the last sort of couple of decades, but building on um, Francesco's 
point about the, the urgency. Uh, at what point are we going to get to the point where we're limited on how much we can do with the models and then we have to step into the sort of use of experts and the modeling community being the experts because we haven't been able to develop the models as far uh, in advance as we would ideally like to. And, and Francesco had 2030 up on, on, on his um, slide. Um, are we going to be at the point by 2030 when the models can provide us with all the answers or are we going to have to then also be the experts that advise policymakers on what to do next, potentially because we've missed the 2030 targets anyway. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Two very good questions. And uh, Francesco, we'll start with you now, final round. Uh, either you can respond to one of the questions or, or add one more research priority to, to challenge the community here with, please. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't think I'm gonna add a priority. Maybe just start from, from the last comment, or the last two comments actually. One of the dimensions that it's always there because we talk about climate smart agriculture, but then <clears throat> basically focus, of course, on, on mitigation and adaptation is, is, you know, that all of this needs to happen. And, you know, and I speak, of course, here also with my hat from FAO to safeguard, you know, food supply and food security. So in my mind, when we talk about co-benefits, uh that's 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 the angle that that emerges very very strongly and it also helps you know decide what to do in various countries depending on their situation uh, going back to the models yes there is urgency for me um you know i look at this more you know uh fortunately or unfortunately depending on how you look at it but from an engineering perspective so if you look at mitigation, I mean, what models need to do increasingly is help us develop scenarios that safeguard robustness of those solutions against climate change, like I said before. And what I didn't say before is that if the angle is adaptation. By the way, we're looking in a world, you know, we're going into a world where, especially in agriculture, we're going to have to do more and more adaptation without even worrying about the synergies with mitigation, you know, because that's going to be the safeguard of food security. But then the models need to help us prioritize those solutions going beyond what we've been doing in the past, which is testing a set of laundry list kind of solutions that we know work, that probably already have been implemented by all the farmers around the world up to now. But what do we do next when you know the next uh, uh, wave of very harsh droughts and flooding hit, hit us? Oh. Thanks, Francesco. Mariana? Um, there were a couple of questions. You uh, can respond to the questions or throw in a final <laughs> remark. But So there was a question about whether the adaptation or the measures in general should be the same for low input systems and high input systems. And I don't think they should. Um, and if you look around in the low input systems, and probably most of the area in the world, uh, they are diverse, so they might have different targets. And actually, I've been thinking recently, can we learn from those systems that, that they were kept diverse and they are exposed to extreme event and to, and to climate change? What can we learn? Because our systems, high input systems, by being very productive, are also very vulnerable. So what can we learn? From those low system, low input systems, and how they respond to extremes. Thank you, Apobo, please. Yeah, like uh, for the uh, mitigation and adaptation uh, uh, intervention, sometimes uh, we uh, suggest farmer to like change, like how farmer do their farming. So uh, for the mitigation and adaptation strategy, there should be some like uh, like benefits for the farmer, like some incentives for the farmer who who are like taking this like interventions otherwise you know like uh, there are many challenges like uh, taking this new new interventions like we suggested through like modeling studies yeah thank you thanks Bruno I want to touch on another point about technologies not not necessarily being the answer because you got to look at the complexity of agriculture with a different lens and for example, the moment we improve technologies to be more efficient 
in reducing water use for an alfalfa crop in Arizona, we are only legitimized an error and we should change the system altogether. So I'm not willing to provide solutions just because the technology is so cool and so capable of reducing the water by half when there is no water altogether, right? So the problem, why are we there in this context? Because it pays off. Someone is making money and someone is not willing to change. And so that's where the opportunity of using a system approach that quantifies the externalities and the potential change before they are implemented have to be done with stakeholders that come from a social science. So the biophysical science alone will never succeed. So you have to bring different actors to the table to be able to show that it's the mindset of the people and the willingness to, the, you know, to change and bring the farmers and understand the risk that they bear. You and I are risk neutral when we give a suggestion, but they're not, they bear the risk. And so the models can quantify their level of risk the other problem is that agriculture, the trillion dollar industry, bases on the golden rule, the one that has gold rules, and means, you know, the agrochemicals, the seed companies, you telling them not to grow corn anymore, do you think they're going to say, okay, thank you, good, for, good suggestion, uh, they'd never, that's never going to happen. And so that's the complexity. That's why farmers are not willing to change immediately. You can suggest you should be growing lentils and farmers told me they couldn't sell it for the pet shop because there is no market demand. So, so that's where the incentives have to come. And that's basically my final point is biophysical sciences closely linked to social sciences to bring the system approach to a potential alternative uh, systems. Thanks, Bruno. And uh, Veronica, you started the whole panel here. It's your privilege to have the last remarks. And then finally, we can have dinner, you can have breakfast, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the sun has finally come up here in Australia. So I'm pleased to be in the daylight at the moment. Um, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build exactly on what Bruno said and, and kind of end with saying, um, look, the models will never tell us everything we need to do. Uh, models are never perfect. Models are inherently hypotheses in many ways. Um, the, e even if they could tell us what to do biophysically, they, they can never fully take into account the, the motivations, the incentives of the people who need to use them to make decisions. Um, so, so actually, you know, there's been a lot that's talked about here in terms of learning from others, reaching out, incorporating this, incorporating that. Um, and I would say, you know, the, the kind of theme to me is, is actually just, just reach out and collaborate and understand who it is that has the ability to take action and what they need from models to help them do that. And then let that guide all of all of your decisions about about how modeling contributes um but you know will never in itself solve this um giant mess that we've gotten ourselves into thanks veronica so this worked out really great this ends our day um and uh, a big round of applause for the whole panel thank you, thank you.